Hello there and welcome to video number three of paleobiogeography in which we're going to be looking at barriers, mixing and evolution. So let's start with the first of these barriers. So what are barriers? Well, biogeographic provinces are partitioned by barriers of a variety of different types. They are Barriers are just something that limits the distribution of organisms. So a really good example of a, a barrier relatively close to home is the Berlin Wall. That stopped people from um, going between the east and west of Berlin because it was a big physical barrier in the way. Um, barriers in terms of biogeography are more often than not fairly porous to an extent, so was the Berlin Wall. Lots of people escaped over it, right? Um, for example, a famous uh, paleobiologist, a guy called George Gaylord Simpson, defined three types of passages which organisms can use to move through a barrier. Corridors are always open, so these are, um, are just small, limited um, range uh, crossovers which organisms can use. Filters allow restricted access between two um, uh, provinces. And sweepstake routes open only occasionally. So these are kind of like very occasional um, crossing points between two um, different provinces. So barriers can be physical, such as the example with the Berlin Wall um, on the left here. They can be climatic. They can be geological. For example, they could reflect a difference in soil type between regions. They could be biological. So that could be, for example, um, due to competition uh, in differing between different reading regions. They could be historical. Um, a nice example of that is the distributions we still have today based on past content continental configurations. And all of these can also be impacted by chance. So examples of barriers in a continental setting may be mountain ranges or valleys, such as those shown in the middle here in Norway. Um, they could be inland seas, or they could even be rainforests, for example. Marine faunas may be separated by wide expanses of deep ocean, by swift ocean currents, or by land. So uh, an example is shown here on the right of an isthmus, a th kind of thin spit of land between two land masses, which will often uh, separate biogeographic provinces. Provinces can be fragmented relatively rapidly if a barrier arises, and the biotic response can also be a bit sudden. So let's have a look at what happens when um, barriers and uh, corridors arise. So to preface this, bear in mind that this, like many things that we deal with, is a very human concept of um, of trying to, to div divide um, things in different categories and understand the world. And that what is a barrier for one organism may also be a corridor for another. So a really famous example that I think illustrates this well is the emergence of the Isthmus of Panama about 2.8 million years ago. So you can see the Isthmus of Panama on this map around here. Prior to this point, uh, North and South American land masses had been separate. The appearance of this isthmus connected them. But at the same time, the appearance of the um, isthmus also separated the Atlantic from the Pacific Oceans. So what was a corridor for land animals became a barrier for those organisms living in the sea. I think this is also a really good example that allows us to um, study the impact that changes in, um, say, continental configuration can have. So prior to the appearance of this isthmus, South America had been isolated from North America for most of the past 17 million years. South America was dominated by a diverse but specialised mammalian fauna um, that uh, can um, included, for example, uh, some unique marsupials. Um, on the uh, bottom here, you can see an example of uh, Manito del Monte, um, one of South America's, in fact, South America's only um, marsupial that is a member of the uh, group called the Australidelphian marsupials. Oh, that's a word I've not pronounced before. Australidelphian marsupials. So basically, this is an unusual marsupial that um, is, is the only instance of its kind known in South America. The um, Remaining uh, mammals in South America included Edentates. This is a group that includes the anteaters, the sloths, and the armadillos. 
Um, bottom right is a living example of this group. Um, and a series of specialized ungulates, so that's hooved mammals and rodents. In contrast with that South American and what I find slightly alien fauna, then in North America, um, we find animals that feel more familiar. For example, um, we have the beaver here and the bison. These are examples of North American mammals. The Isthmus of Panama and its development allowed terrestrial and freshwater taxa to move north and south across this land bridge. And what then occurred is a thing that we call the Great American Biotic Interchange, or GABI. Uh, this map shows uh, in gray North American species with South American ancestors up here. And in purple down here, you can see South American species of North American origin. So the North American fauna invaded the South, destabilizing sorry, many of the continent's distinctive mammalian populations and a load of um, organisms went extinct. At the same time, some South American mammals were successful in the North and some, such as the armadillo, the opossum and the porcupine still survive in North America today. Of course, many of the other organisms that made this crossover are now extinct, as you can tell from the outlines in this image. But as well as the impact on land, as I've mentioned, this corridor, um, or this, this link between the two um, land masses, also created a barrier um, for marine organisms. So not many species, somewhat surprisingly, became extinct. Um, and indeed, there is a diverse, di diversification recorded in the mollusks at the uh, time that this um, barrier was erected across the ocean. But there was also no further gene flow between shallow water marine populations of the Caribbean Sea and of the Pacific Ocean after about 3.2 million years ago. And it's actually been proposed that the emergence of this land bridge might have initiated the upwelling of nutrients in the Caribbean area, and this coupled with genetic isolation, in turn led to an increase in species diversity related to this barrier. So in general, this is a complex picture of um, what can happen when barriers uh, change uh, on a continental scale. And in fact, it's a mighty fine example of what we may call biotic immigration events, or BIMEs. I don't really feel I can pronounce that BIMEs. I don't think that works. Either way, these events are relatively common in the fossil record, and they have significantly impacted biodiversity through geological time. We're confident from the fossil record that this is the case. However, they are associated both with biodiversity increases in some instances, thanks to, for example, perhaps changes in niche partitioning, uh, changes in species packing, and higher species speciation rates, but also they've been implicated in biodiversity decline. Um, for example, it's been suggested um, that biodiversity declines after these events due to elevated extinction and or reduced speciation rates. So it's a complicated picture um, in terms of what happens when we have these immigration events. And modeling has been used recently to try and figure out a bit more about what happens during one of these events. And it's this kind of I wanted to focus on for this slide. It's based on this 27, sorry, 27, 2017 paper that I've um, cited in the bottom here. And this introduced and focused on a two-phase occupation um, of new eco-space. So it's a model that um, models two phases of this occupation. And these images show the result of this modeling overprinted on the paleogeography of the late Devonian period, shown on the left-hand side here. We'll learn more about these different continents in the next video, because I'm going to give a, a bit more of an in-depth overview of that. So initially, in this late Devonian world that we're using as an example for this modeling, each basin comprises a single unique species, as you can see here, a square I guess that's a triangle, kind of, a star, and a circle. When existing species colonize a new region, there is an initial lack of speciation, but the colonization has increased alpha, so that's within community diversity, at the expense of beta, that's between community diversity. Gamma, or provincial 
global diversity remains unchanged. So these are these three measures here. You can see by joining up these um, different basins, we have made some changes to the diversity within and between these, but not uh, as a whole for this entire region where we still only got four species. So that's shown on the top right here. And that may happen, for example, thanks to a change in sea level, allowing dispersal amongst these basins um, and thus creating one of these biotic immigration events. If that is followed by isolation, so dispersal pathways are shut off, for example, in this case, that could be caused by a drop in sea level, there may follow a phase of speciation within each of these basins and all three diversity metrics increase. This is the situation that's shown on the bottom left here. On this basis, we might expect that oscillations within area connectivity, shown in the bottom middle and bottom right here, um, can generate a robust and effective mechanism for both substantial accumulation of new biodiversity and for the persistence of existing species. So it could be that um, different combinations of uh, BIMEs um, allow um, different dynamics in terms of diversity to appear within the fossil record and could explain why we see these changes. We also need to think about evolution within this context. So at the moment we've been talking about um, organisms just moving throughout space, but we've also got the element of time. So in time uh, we know that evolution happens. Uh, and it can impact on the distribution of the organisms that we see today. So if we're thinking um, about organisms moving from place to place, what we've already seen, that's a thing that we can call dispersal. Organisms move, they disperse. But they can also evolve their modern geographic distributions through a process of subdivision of originally wide ranges. So that's shown in this diagram on the um, on the slide here. So you can see here in panel A, we have a modern day species distribution um, of species B, C and D. And those are split across three areas. However, these could all be um, have evolved from a single species, species A. So this is our ancestral pop population. We may expect, for example, um, some kind of uh, dispersal event where species A moves into a new region and eventually over time that can evolve to be species B. Then we may expect, or is not inconceivable, that with species A having this very large range shown here, a barrier could be erected splitting that into two different um, sub-populations. Each one of those populations could then go on to speciate to become a different species and that would leave us with species C and D accompanied with the extinction of species A. What within this context the extinction of species A actually means, given that it is now C and D, is a whole can of worms that I suggest we don't really open. But this shows you that both how dispersal, how barriers uh, as well, can interact with evolution to create species um, distributions uh, that are based on evolution as well as dispersal. So I hope that makes sense. You can see a, an example of the phylogeny um, that's based on this uh, scenario at the top here. And one species that's being caused by dispersal and two more that are caused by this thing called V, this evolution of new species in new areas. So I think that's useful to think about. And this idea, the idea that you can have the separation of an ancestral biota into two or more biotas following the formation of a geographical barrier that stops gene flow is something that's called vicariance, hence the V on the last slide. A really good example of this is the distribution of modern flightless birds, which are widely scattered. So for example, you can see here a rhea that's found in South America. You can see an emu um, and a cassowary. Um, not shown here, but those are found in Australia. There are ostriches, which are found in Africa, and kiwis, uh, such as the ones shown here, and extinct mowers, one of those is shown here, um, that were alive, well, the kiwi is still alive, just about, thankfully, but the mowers are now extinct, uh, but those 
were found in New Zealand. So these are creatures that are not able to fly, but are scattered over a whole range of different continents. And the reason this is, is that the group arose in the late Cretaceous when all of these continents were collected. And as the southern continents drifted apart, they carried their flightless bird species with them, which then speciated and became quite different to form the different birds that you can see on this slide today. Hence, as paleobiogeography um, aficionados, as we will all be by the end of this lecture, we have to take into account both dispersal but also vicariance as possible models to explain the distribution of fossils and of living species. Um, and these both occur over a range of scales, um, both temporal and spatial. And as such, the, the kind of differentiating between dispersal and vicariance can be a little bit difficult to untangle. So just bear that in mind. And that is it from me for this video. Uh, I will see you in the next video. Where we're going to be looking at a single example of paleobiogeography, and that's an ancient ocean called Iaptus. I'll see you there shortly.